For the past century, Russian history has also been the history of its security services. They were used by the Soviet state to crush dissent. Millions suffered at their hands. But while many things may have changed in today's Russia, its security network is arguably stronger than ever. And the reason behind that is the rise of a lowly lieutenant colonel to president of this vast country. I know the KGB better than anyone else because I was part of the inside circle. This is the story of the KGB, told by its veterans and its victims. In the summer of 1991, secret orders were sent out from KGB headquarters to field officers throughout the Soviet Union. My colleagues and I saw preparations for repression. We saw work taking place on case files, handcuffs ordered, prison capacity expanded. We were involved in the process. Some officers wanted nothing to do with it. I was among them. So I resigned. The chairman of the KGB, Vladimir Kruchkov, had ordered a quarter of a million pairs of handcuffs and 300,000 arrest warrants and cancelled all KGB leave. Citizens of Moscow knew nothing of all this until the tanks were on the streets. Ввести чрезвычайное положение в отдельных местностях СССР на срок 6 месяцев. The announcement didn't reveal that President Gorbachev was under house arrest in his dacha in the Crimea. He managed to record a brief message to the Soviet people, and aides smuggled it out. KGB hardliners believed that Gorbachev brought it all on himself, introducing Western-style reform. With perestroika, which was introduced by Mikhail Gorbachev, there should have been a concrete plan. When there's no plan, it's chaos, and that's what Gorbachev created. The KGB was committed to saving the Soviet Union. Indeed, that's one of the reasons why the head of the KGB was part of a, a coup against Gorbachev in August 1991. As tanks closed in around the White House, Russia's parliament, the people realized that their government was under threat and thousands came out onto the streets. In the early morning, I rushed to the White House. I was thinking that they would arrest me. Then I approached the White House and saw a crowd there. Extraordinary. Crowds put their bodies in the way of tanks and trucks, determined to stop the putsch. Tank crews were reluctant to hurt the protesters. They had to choose, fire on your own people or switch sides. The standoff continued through the night. No one knew which way it was going to go. The following morning, when Boris Yeltsin stepped onto a tank, the crowd cheered. A simple handshake effectively determined the coup was over. President Gorbachev returned to Moscow, having steadfastly refused to negotiate with the coup leaders who'd held him and his family captive. The leaders of the KGB didn't understand the mindset of their own officers. They didn't understand that most KGB officers wouldn't support the putsch. 
The cadre of coup leaders became known as the August Kings. They were all arrested, except Boris Pugo, who killed himself to avoid capture. The Putsch in 1991 failed because the people preparing it were incompetent. They hadn't made contact with the army, they didn't have a clear plan, and also I think they failed to account for the fact that by 1991, quite a lot of Russians weren't willing to go back to the old Soviet times. And the putsches seemed really like yesterday's men, you know, they just wanted to dial back the clock. The leaders of the coup were in large part the old guard of the Soviet Union, who'd watched with despair the, the reforms. But they had no new ideas to offer, they had no new policies, and uh, had their coup succeeded, I think it would have been a recipe for disaster. The last gasp of the old guard was symbolized by the toppling of Felix Dzerzhinsky from his place of honor in Lubyanka Square. The founder of Lenin's security service was carted away face down to the delight of a celebrating crowd. But President Mikhail Gorbachev was no longer the man of the moment either. Boris Yeltsin had taken the initiative and captured the public imagination. Вот Борис Николаевич мне сейчас, когда уже мы встретились, он дал краткое изложение заседания Кабинета Министров, но я его еще не читал. А вот сочетайте. The dissolution of the Soviet Union was the end of Gorbachev's empire, and Boris Yeltsin, president of Russia, was ruthless in dispatching him. Having dissolved the old KGB and split it into several parts, Yeltsin now had control of the security apparatus. His idea of reform was superficial. The idea was just to split the agency. So you have a monster, you just split it into different parts, and that gives you some sort of uh, control. He can't forget that this is a great threat to his position. So he breaks it up into its component parts, foreign intelligence, domestic intelligence, border guard, signals intelligence, communications, and so forth. Uh, he also sacks large numbers of its staff, weeding out people who are probably hostile towards him. Yeltsin turned his attention to the domestic agenda. He saw the need to raise living standards. And from January 1992, he came up with a big idea. He announced that state-owned industries would be handed back to the people. Everyone would be given shares. Large-scale privatization was intended to give citizens a personal stake in the Russian economy. But the public had no experience of a private economy. So many of these shares were snapped up for pennies by a few entrepreneurs. Lots of people saying, everything's falling apart. No one knows what's going on. This is a great opportunity to basically embezzle huge amounts of money from official funds, stick them in secret accounts that no one else has access to. And so when the system does fall apart, me and my friends are going to be rich. Soon, Moscow had almost 100 billionaires, while most Russians struggle to survive. There's not many people who are making large amounts of money in the mid-90s who aren't in some way or other involved in organized crime. The Yeltsin years were marked by a dramatic rise in violence and corruption. Russia became notorious as the Wild East. Mafias of every description took control of business. Those they didn't own outright were forced to pay protection money. Inevitably, the people cried out for an end to the chaos. The Internal Security Service, rebranded under Yeltsin as the Federal Service of the Russian Federation, the FSB, now stepped into the breach. Former KGB officers start taking over businesses in the mid-1990s. It's a means of employing the security apparatus to restore law and order, they would say. But at the same time, it means that they themselves move into the business of organized crime.
Everyone had a family and had to provide for that family. People left the service and founded private security organizations running security services for big corporations. They needed experienced people who knew how security systems could be organized, and by the way, they paid big money. In the 1990s, there's a booming industry of security. Former KGB officials flourish in this sphere. They go into banking security, bodyguards, high-level oligarchs, working out their own security apparatus. And so a lot of KGB officers make a great deal of success of the 1990s. The difference between the FSB and the KGB is the ideological motivation. The KGB officer is someone who represents the interests of their class within the state. The FSB officer represents, I believe, the interests of the state, but tries to incorporate his own interests at the same time. The end of the Soviet Union, when there was a realization in the KGB that they were the only people with access to foreign currency, effective networks, means of getting things done. And this was the time to leverage this into personal fortune. Because all of the vast reserves of foreign currency that were at the KGB's disposal overseas could now be turned into making money. One lieutenant colonel from the former KGB was well placed to capitalize on these recent developments. Vladimir Putin returned to his home city of Leningrad and landed a job in City Hall. He was kept on what's called the active reserve, where you sort of stay within the service, but you actually get a job outside. And in short order, he ended up um, at the mayor's office, where, because he spoke foreign languages and so forth, he became an advisor on international affairs. And in some ways, that was the making of him, because he caught the eye of the mayor, Sobchak. Anatoly Sobchak was a rising star, a man many saw as a future president. I think Putin recognized, if I go with Sobchak, then there will be loads of new possibilities. There, you can shape the new Russia more in your own interests or in the interests of your own progress. And he basically became Sobchak's fixer. Fixer, bagman, he was the guy who liaised with the powerful local organized crime syndicates. He was the guy who basically kept things working. Putin was typical of a whole generation of KGB officers who used their power um, in the past to become very rich. And they were then in a position by the late 1990s and early 2000s to retake a political role as well. Later, in what was now St. Petersburg, Putin became friends with Boris Beresovsky, one of a number of oligarchs who'd made vast fortunes when the Soviet Union collapsed. Russia at that time was in a really bad situation in terms of food supplies. And people would stand in lines to buy bread and everyday stuff. But in St. Petersburg, things were OK. And Yeltsin called Sobchak, who was the mayor of St. Petersburg at the time and said, how come you have everything and we have problems around the country? And Sobchak said, well, you know, we are on the Baltic Sea, we are in Finland, I mean, and we have a very good, nice guy who handles all this stuff. What's his name? Well, Putin, well, let him come to Moscow. And when he came to Moscow, again, you know, he ended up working for some of the most corrupt figures within the Russian government as their loyal henchman. And that's how he rose. Putin's friend, Beresovsky, was highly influential in Moscow. He funded Yeltsin's re-election and later claimed that it was he who suggested that Putin might be effective as head of the FSB. Yeltsin duly appointed him in July 1998. Putin's command of Russia's security service marks the return of intolerance. Internal critics were again viewed as enemies, plotting with the West to bring down the state. Prominent among those critics was Galina Starovoitova. An outspoken Russian MP, she tried twice to pass a bill that would exclude Communist Party officials 
and crucially former employees of the security services from taking political office. She was often asked, aren't you afraid? She would answer, yes, but I've taken this path and there's no turning back. Galina Starovoidova was one of the first Russian MPs to act differently from other politicians. She was human, she talked like other Russians, she wasn't seeking to make money for herself, and she was mysteriously murdered in the stairway of her St. Petersburg apartment building. They were professional hitmen. The ringleader who ran the gang of killers is now in jail. The people who order serious political assassinations are never caught in our country. They don't investigate themselves. It's a very usual way, I would say, kind of tradition for the Russian law enforcement to investigate only the low level. Like, you have a high-profile killing, you just investigate the people who actually physically did that but you never try to investigate the whole chain to find masterminds. There is nothing to connect Starovoitova's murder with Vladimir Putin. But if her legislation had become law, he could never have migrated from the security services into political office. This impediment removed, Putin used his security service to get President Yeltsin out of a tight spot. The Attorney General Yuri Skaratov was preparing a corruption case against the very highest state officials. Putin used FSB surveillance to catch Skaratov having sex with two prostitutes and broadcast the footage on national television. Skaratov tearfully resigned, and his allegations about corrupt politicians were silenced. It would not be long before Putin was promoted to prime minister. From the beginning, Prime Minister Putin painted a picture of Russia under siege, both from external enemies and from separatist extremists within. Territorial целостность России не может быть предметом обсуждения, тем более торга или шантажа против каждого, кто на нее посягнет. Just one month after he took office, four apartment blocks in major Russian cities were bombed. The outrage was attributed to Chechen rebels. But former KGB investigator Mikhail Trapashkin believes Putin was well placed to take advantage. These apartment bombings may have happened as a specific provocation to start a war in the Caucasus and to win dividends for an upcoming election. Only I can fight terrorism. Just look at what's happening here. The Chechens are becoming too audacious, bombing here in the center of Moscow. That's why we should bomb them. Of course, anyone who would fight terrorism was immediately a hero. And I think it was a factor in Putin's high popularity rating for years. No rigorous investigation has been undertaken into these bombings. So all kinds of accusations have floated around. It's got a lot of people killed who've made these accusations too, but we haven't got to the bottom of that mystery. Whoever was behind these atrocities, they convinced the Russian people once again that their country was under siege and they needed a strong leader. Within three months of these bombings, Boris Yeltsin conferred the office of president on Vladimir Putin. In the eight years between the collapse of the Soviet Union and Putin taking the highest public office, a new class of political figure had arisen, the Siloviki. It was peopled by well-connected former KGB officers who had climbed over the old guard and assumed authority. With Putin in the top job and these like-minded figures in support, the Siloviki had become a formidable force. With Putin's in charge, uh, 
well, actually, the KGB took over. This is really a unique situation. Uh, well, in the old Soviet days, the Soviet system was built on three pillars. Communist Party, the security service, and the uh, military industrial complex. With the collapse of the USSR, number one now is KGB, with the president of the country, former KGB officer from St. Petersburg, I mean, Mr. Putin. When he found out that he was going to be made president just in the December of 99, he gave a speech at the Lubyanka to the gathered KGB officers. There's a, a round of applause and laughter afterwards in the room, but it's not entirely clear whether he was joking or not. As an early demonstration of his authority, Putin set about crushing Chechnya. The West had been urging restraint, but after the apartment bombings, the gloves were off. This new offensive was much better planned and executed than Yeltsin's previous campaigns. The enemy was no longer the Chechens. This was the beginning of a war on terror. Putin had boots on the ground there for the next 10 years. Officially, the Second Chechen War was not a war. It was a counter-terrorism operation. And the thing is that uh, when you have a counter-terrorism operation, the primary role is, by definition, given to the security services, not to the military. Colonel Yevgeny Petrushin served in the Second Chechen War. He led an alpha unit of Spetsnaz, or special forces. They were established under the KGB specifically for counter-terrorism operations. We had a new president and he ordered the liquidation of terrorism on Chechen territory because it had become a center for the elite of world terrorism. They were all in Chechnya. Chechen fighters were no match for the Russian military. Grozny was virtually razed to the ground. But in October 2002, the militants took the fight to Moscow. They attacked a theater, taking the cast, orchestra, and the entire audience hostage. The gunmen demanded an end to the Chechen war, which had been triggered by the apartment bombings three years before. They threatened to blow up the theater with 850 hostages inside. A Russian journalist, Anna Politkovskaya, was allowed in to try and negotiate terms. Day and night, live images were beamed around the world. Hostages made brief calls on their cell phones. Татьяна, скажите, пожалуйста, а сейчас есть рядом с вами кто-то из террористов? Да, у нас тут девушки, девушки все в взрывчатках. When two captives were executed, the FSB was standing by, ready to mount an assault. We woke at 5:55 a.m. We were on full alert. And, you know, I noticed a strange smell, and I'd left my gas mask on a shelf in my quarters. I quickly ran to get it. I grabbed it, put it on. As soon as I got there, we blew off the door and moved in. The terrorists had laid explosives around the theater, and the women among them wore suicide vests. <laughs> 
the security forces had devised a strategy to minimize loss of life. Before Colonel Petrushin and his FSB Special Forces crew went in, anesthetic gas, a thousand times more potent than morphine, had been piped into the building. The idea was to subdue everyone inside. We quickly moved through the first row. Right in front of me, a terrorist was reaching for his machine gun. I saw his eyes widening. He must have known his time was up. After a brief firefight, all the terrorists were reported dead. But evacuating and reviving the hostages proved difficult. A medical specialist from MEC was walking around with plenty of gold braid on his shoulders. He was saying, this one's dead, that one and that one. Then the first person coughed and opened his eyes. You know, that describes the professional level of our doctors. It was made even more challenging for the medics because no one would tell them which gas had been used. The government says 130 hostages died. But a public investigation set the figure at 174. Regarding all the fuss about the gas, I will say again, we are soldiers. We are at war. As he had promised in 1999, Putin now had justification to crush the Chechen resistance for a generation. He sent in his elite forces. Special operation forces of the FSB, they played much more important role because they were better trained. Colonel Petrushin was dispatched for a second tour in Chechnya. Yes, I'm a soldier. A soldier is not a murderer. He has God's permission to protect his country. But just like the apartment bombings, the trigger for the new onslaught in Grozny, the theater siege, may not have been quite as it seemed. There was intelligence. A lot of people knew that fighters had arrived in Moscow. Something was brewing, but no one took action to stop it. Colonel Mikhail Trepashkin also finds it suspicious that all the hostage takers were shot dead. It's understandable if they're armed and dangerous, but an unarmed man on his knees was shot in the back of his head. It would have been better to fully investigate someone than to have killed every one. What could they gain from keeping any of them alive? A complicated trial, more chance for propaganda from the Chechen cause. It's very inconvenient to have celebrity terrorists, uh, and that's the last thing they want. An independent inquiry was launched into the theater siege. Of the six investigators involved, one died in a hail of bullets in Moscow, a second was poisoned, and a third was murdered in her apartment building. Mikhail Trapashkin was also one of the six. He served four years in prison on trumped up charges. Still the most vocal of the surviving three, he may be living on borrowed time. In Putin's Russia, anyone who raises their head above the parapet is in grave danger. In 2003, the billionaire oligarchs who had underwritten his ascent to the presidency were summoned to St. Catherine's Hall in the Kremlin. Mikhail Khodorkovsky, the wealthiest of all the oligarchs, took the opportunity to raise concerns about state corruption. Масштабы коррупции в России, оцениваемые экспертами четырех организаций, приблизительно одинаковые. В районе 30 миллиардов оценивается долларов. Putin was visibly angry and criticized Kordakovsky's oil empire, Yukos. Надо отдать должное руководству компании Yukos. Она договорилась с налоговой службой, приняла все претензии и закрыла все проблемы Khodorkovsky was arrested soon after and served a total of 10 years, mostly in a Siberian prison camp. <laughs> 
His business was seized, and the oligarchs were left in no doubt who runs the country. Journalists have also tried to hold the state to account. Between the criminal world and the security services, they stand little chance. They warn them before, then when those warnings aren't heeded, they kill them. And the murders are not there just to remove them, though that is a factor. It's there to send a message to the less bold journalists that this is what faces you if you are as brave as that. Yuri Shekhachikin, who exposed KGB corruption and vigorously opposed the Chechen war, died in what can only be described as suspicious circumstances. According to the law, Shekhachikin died naturally. Of course, that's if you can call it a natural death, when a person starts losing his hair, his skin peels away, he suddenly gets 20 years older, and all his organs stop working and he dies within four days. If that's supposed to be a natural death, I find it suspicious. In Russia, to be a real free journalist is a very risky business. It's a really risky life. Another journalist, Anna Politkovskaya, who had tried to negotiate a resolution to the theatre siege, ignored warnings. She championed human rights for minorities and campaigned against the Chechen war. She too was silenced brutally. She died on Vladimir Putin's birthday. No one can say who ordered her execution. The fact that the Politkovskaya case has never been solved, yet no further investigations are underway, leads me to believe that the people who ordered the hit are still in power. Shekhachikin and Politkovskaya both worked for Novaya Gazeta. It's one of the last major independent newspapers in Russia. Most of the media is owned or controlled by the state. Six of Novaya Gazeta's correspondents have met untimely deaths in the era of the FSB. Yet no one can say with certainty who was behind their deaths. Everyone, from common criminals to oligarchs, has the impression that it's OK to kill or maim journalists because nothing will happen. Mikhail Trapashkin is still alive. But some inside the FSB wished otherwise. He left the organization in 1997 and has been a constant critic of corruption in the service ever since. Some of his former colleagues still serving secretly admire his stance, and they've stayed his execution more than once. In 1998, Colonel Alexander Litvinenko dropped by uninvited. He said, hello, Misha, I'm your killer, Sasha Litvinenko. Litvinenko had been ordered to kill Trapashkin, but instead he too rebelled. Together with other FSB rebels, they held a press conference. Litvinenko exposed the actions of some senior officers engaged in illegal activity, thus tarnishing the reputation of the service. He also announced that there is a department for extrajudicial execution. To no one's surprise, the authorities moved against the rebels, first arresting the spokesman Litvinenko. He was taken into custody. I worked alongside his defense counsel. The first charge was thrown out, but on a second charge, I think he might have been acquitted, but Sasha suddenly disappeared. He then reappeared in London. 
He'd been reliably informed that on his way to court, he would be snatched. He'd never have a chance of getting an acquittal. He'd be eliminated. They'd either fake a car crash or just shoot him. So he decided to save himself. The runaway colonel was denounced as a traitor and quite literally became a target of special forces. Why was it necessary, after he left, to pin his photo onto targets at the special forces firing range? He had no secrets to trade. He wasn't a secret keeper. Even now, there's no evidence that he betrayed anyone or gave away secrets. He simply didn't have that kind of information. He was only involved in fighting organized crime. Litvinenko's fatal error may have been writing about Vladimir Putin's personal life. He raised the issue of homosexuality among FSB leaders, this kind of thing. He even told some personal stories. Putin and Litvinenko both were graduates of the KGB guys. They knew each other. And Litvinenko knew some parts of Putin's private life. He, would, he, would, he made it them public. And I warned him over the phone, calling from Washington. I said, Alexander, you should not talk about Putin's private life because you may be in trouble. You do not understand who you are dealing with. Six months later, Litvinenko was dead, poisoned by polonium. The poison attack was a warning to others. If you step out of line, there is no safe refuge. Radioactive polonium destroyed Alexander Litvinenko over 22 agonizing days. It's always supposed to have been part of the popular folklore of the Soviet and ex-Soviet intelligence agencies that defectors are dealt with in the most painful and ruthless manner possible. We hear the stories from the defectors during the 1980s of how they would be shown videos of traitors being fed feet first into a furnace while still alive in order to teach a lesson to everybody else. No one can be certain of those stories, but the British public inquiry concluded that Litvinenko's murder was probably approved by Nikolai Petrushev and also President Putin. It named the killers Andrei Lugovoy and Dmitry Kovtun, but Russia has always refused their extradition. Viktor Yushchenko is one of the few who drank from the poisoned chalice, but lived to tell the tale. In the autumn of 2004, these streets were thronging with his supporters as he ran for president of Ukraine. He hoped he might lead his country into NATO and the EU. Late one Sunday in September, he was summoned to the deputy head of the Ukraine Security Service, formerly the KGB. After a short and rather frosty meeting, they sat down for a meal together. They served salads, rice, and some sort of meat. I told them I wanted to go because I was feeling unwell. But they pressed me to stay for some fruit dessert, watermelon. We were in the house for another 15 minutes or so. A group photograph was taken. Then the catering staff came out to wave us off. Then I felt a pain worse than anything in my life. Yushchenko was driven home with a searing headache. His wife was immediately alarmed. She kissed me and said, 
she could taste something metallic on my lips. Hours later, racked with pain, Yashenko was rushed to a local clinic. But after exhaustive tests, doctors still didn't know what was wrong. Gravely concerned, the senior consultant advised him to urgently seek specialist treatment abroad. He warned, if you don't go now, you're a dead man. Yashenko was flown by air ambulance to Austria. They sent tissue samples to four foreign laboratories for analysis, each conducting specialist tests. Only then they were able to determine that I'd been poisoned with dioxin. The dioxin concentration in his body was 50,000 times higher than normal. That last supper was obviously suspect, but the entire catering crew evaded questioning. The whole team that cooked and served the food that night are in Moscow. Viktor Yushchenko is lucky to be alive. He went on to be president of Ukraine, but his West-leaning policies were stymied. Putin would never accept the NATO alliance on his doorstep not least because he had his eye on Crimea. Crimea was strategically valuable. It had a Black Sea coastline and until 1991 had been part of the Soviet Union. Of course, the breakdown of the Soviet Empire and the communist regime seemed like a tragedy to those who had been brainwashed by Soviet propaganda. But for Crimean Tatars, it was a cause for celebration. The Tatars had enjoyed nation status under the government of Ukraine. But in 2014, heavily armed men in combat fatigues, but without insignia, appeared on the streets. These were Russian security service units, together with Russians who'd settled in Ukraine, asserting Russian authority. Putin had annexed Crimea. Before the occupation, I had a long phone conversation with Putin. He spent 40 minutes telling me how good life would be for Crimean Tatars under Russian occupation. I told him, if you want to make us happy, take your troops off our territory. Now the FSB chases everyone who expresses disagreement with the occupation. Anyone who shows disloyalty to the occupiers. Today in Crimea, they've established a worse regime than the Soviet one. It's a bandit regime. Recently, we uncovered a secret FSB document. There is one very important sentence. It says, in order to force the Crimean Tatar people to cooperate with the occupation, we must encourage patriotic organizations which have anti-Tatar attitudes. I don't know of any country in the world that would encourage national or religious conflict on a territory they consider their own. But to say I made a mistake and to withdraw from Crimea would be political suicide. The Chechens have a song and the lyrics say, everyone makes mistakes, but only real men can admit they're wrong. It seems to me there are no such men in the Kremlin. One year after the annexation of Crimea, a protest march was organized in Moscow by opposition leader Boris Nemtsov. On the eve of the march, Nemtsov was murdered within sight of the Kremlin. He was shot four times in the head heart, liver, and stomach. All the CCTV cameras in the area were switched off for maintenance. <laughs> 
The killers would need very high security clearance to contrive a blackout so close to the Kremlin walls. Russia is no longer concerned about its denials being plausible. Russia no longer cares whether it is believed. The Novichok poisoning of the Skripals in Salisbury, England, is a striking example. In 2018, two men, quickly identified as officers in the GRU, a military branch of Russian security services, were captured repeatedly on CCTV in the vicinity of Sergei Skripal's home. When named as suspects, they claim to have an interest in Salisbury Cathedral. There doesn't seem to have been any effort put into making these two individuals' cover story plausible. In fact, if you look at what they're saying about their movements in Salisbury, it's almost as though they haven't been shown the CCTV photographs and their movements uh, during that day that have already been established, because they're saying things that are completely incompatible with what's already known. Russian security services seem to operate with impunity at home and abroad. But there are limits. A Lubyanka conversation was recounted to Oleg Kalugin about his own survival. And he asked him, how come Kalugin is still alive? And that Russian guy, a top official, a number three man in the Soviet KGB in the old days, he said, and I quote, had he lived in Europe, in Asia, or elsewhere, he would have been dead a long time ago. But he lives in America. Sorry. FSB assassins don't set foot on American soil. And Russia is no match for America in economic terms. But they do compete aggressively in other ways. And they can do real damage in the virtual world. A lot of people think that having a GDP the size of Spain is a huge disadvantage, but this is one of those cases where it doesn't matter how big it is, it's what you do with it. If Russia is determined to use its national resources to confront what it sees as its adversaries, whether those adversaries are aware of it or not, then it can do, it can exercise power, it can create headaches for those countries that it's targeting. The internet is an inexpensive weapon with global penetration. Russia has found that it can exploit the hyperconnectivity of the internet and the speed at which conspiracy theories flourish to set societies and target countries against each other. The use of hackers, the use of the internet as a, as a weapon, weaponizing social media, all of these things are carried out by the FSB, but through very informal networks, because these informal networks are completely decentralized and completely deniable. Names including Cozy Bear, Office Monkey, and Fancy Bear have emerged as persistent cyber threats to US national security. They have penetrated major institutions in the EU, installing malware in banks, hospitals, power stations, and military facilities as well as diplomatic organizations and governments. All have been associated with Russian intelligence. There is no direct link back to who provided the orders because that is simply not how the Russian system works. You will not be able to find a piece of paper that says, yes, go and hack the US election. Interference in the Brexit debate in Britain and the US election process are still under investigation. No obtainable evidence can prove that Russian interference changed any votes. But James Clapper, the former director of US national intelligence, said it stretches credulity to think that the Russians didn't turn the election. Russia was sowing social discord by pushing the extremist narratives at both ends, uh, setting off disputes and seeing what would happen. If you conduct an operation with, uh, with some very ambitious targets such as regime change, but you fail at that and instead just stir the pot a little and weaken your adversary, disrupt its social cohesion, weaken its societal resilience, weaken its government, trust in authority, etc., then that is still a bonus as far as Russia is concerned. Because in their zero-sum view of security, if you weaken your adversary even by a little, that makes yourself, in relative terms, stronger. This thinking, espoused long ago by the founder of Lenin's security service, Ion Felix Jasinski, has had a resurgence under Putin. In 
and his statue has been quietly restored and now stands in a Moscow sculpture park. In order to understand today's Russia, very important to understand the KGB mentality because Putin and the people around him, really a whole class of people who, who rule Russia, still have that mentality. Any threat, any challenge can never be considered loyal opposition, you know, loyal criticism, people who want to make Russia better. Any challenge is by definition treason. Under Vladimir Putin, the KGB, or FSB as it's now called, rules Russia with an iron rod directly from the Kremlin. To challenge its authority, even from apparent safety abroad, means risking your life. Over a century has passed since Lenin established the organization as a temporary measure to defend the revolution. But the KGB has even managed to outlive communism itself. Today, Russia is no longer a state with a security service. Instead, the security service has a state. Thank you.